bioterrorism is something that people really got wind of in 2001 with the anthrax attacks, but it's something that's been around for a long, long time, even going back into into like 600 BC or so, where people were poisoning wells with biological material. So this is something that's been with us for a, quite a long time. And what really scares people is now that we have the ability and capacity to engineer pathogens, to make them more, more transmissible, vaccine resistant, antibiotic resistant, and there's a willingness to do it. So, for example, the, the former Soviet Union, in defiance of the Biological Weapons Convention, which they had signed, had an extensive clandestine biological weapons program that was offensive, that was going to be mounted on missiles that they were going to use to attack other countries. And this was only found out basically through um, uh, a clandestine lab that had an accident and had an anthrax attack in the 19, an anthrax outbreak in the 1970s in a town called Sverdlovsk, which was covered up by the Soviet Union, eventually discovered by the Americans, and it was something that really got people thinking that this is a major threat that hadn't gone away. And there are many countries that have tried to weaponize biological weapons. Iraq had done it around the time of the first Gulf War. There are there's evidence that ISIS has tried to to have biological weapons. Uh, Al Qaeda has tried to have biological weapons. We had the anthrax attack in 2001, where five people died and 22 people were infected. So this is something that hasn't gone away. That's something that is clearly there. There were reports even in the last year about North Korea buying all these bioreactors for possible biological weapons. So this is a major threat. And you have to remember that biological weapons are very different than traditional or even nuclear weapons because they're much harder to detect. Many of these diseases occur naturally. So how do you decide whether something is a biological attack or a natural infection? How do you detect them coming into ports? There's no, they don't give off a radiation signature the way a nuclear, a nuclear material does. So it's, it's much more different. And people are going to be scared to death of a biological attack. They're going to run from each other just like they would during a pandemic. So this is a real major societal disruption tool. So biological weapons do remain a, a threat. And I think we're underprepared for them, although we're much more prepared now in 2019 than we were in 2001 when the anthrax attacks occurred. But it is something that's really a core part of our national security, preparing for a biological attack. What do you think we should do to be better prepared? You have to remember that with with biological weapons, that these are infectious diseases that occur naturally. So in general, our assets here are not going to be the military and these traditional things that you think about with warfare. It's actually our, our public health agencies because the experts on anthrax, on botulism, on smallpox, on plague are not in the military per se. Many of them work at, at health departments or at the CDC. So th these agencies need to be properly staffed and funded in order to be able to respond to biological attacks and thought of as national security uh, a part of the national security apparatus. And people get really worried about the, the securitization of public health, but it's important to remember that places like little cities and towns that are going to get, that, that may have a biological attack happen to them, if they're prepared for regular infectious disease outbreaks, they're going to be prepared for biological terrorism. And I do think that that's something that's often overlooked is that, that the, the key link that public health authorities will play in a biological weapons attack. That's one thing. The other thing is making sure that we have vaccines and, and antivirals and antibiotics that are that are stockpiled and ready to be able to go in the case of a, an attack. We do have that that type of capacity with anthrax and some and with smallpox, but probably less so with some of the other agents. And I think it's important to to keep that going. It's now 18 years past the anthrax attack, so many people have forgotten about them. I give lectures to medical students, and they call it an anthrax scare, forgetting that there actually were 22 cases. So I do think that it's important to keep reminding people about the threat of biological weapons and about the need to prepare for uh, biological weapons the way we prepare for for nuclear weapons. Now, as a emergency <clears throat> medicine doctor, have you ever had to respond to any attacks and help contain or treat victims? Well, so there has only there's only been one attack in Stay 2001. Ethics. I was a medical student at that time. I wasn't old enough to be able to be part of that or if, far enough in my training. And there were only 22 cases in the United yeah. States. I did go to, to Haiti after the earthquake as part of a national disaster uh, medical response with the with the federal government. But that's the closest thing I've been to, to kind of a mass casualty type of thing. And this is something you hope that you don't have to do, but it is something that you have to prepare for at, at all levels uh, in the case that in the event that occurs. So we don't even really know what that would look like if, if it happened on a greater scale. There's models and simulations, but we do know we can take things like the pandemic in 2009 with H1N1 flu as a kind of a model for what it would be like if hospitals were inundated with cases, but we don't quite know what will happen if there was a wide, widespread attack. I think it would be really calamitous, especially in today's political environment of what would, what would happen and how 
uh, and how the, the what the repercussions would be. We know that hospitals today are running at, at or near capacity everywhere. So any surge of patients would be very, very difficult to handle. And there would be probably mass societal disruption, even with a small attack. Even We know even when someone has a fake attack with, a, with white powder that they bring in, that creates a major disruption. So if it was a real attack where people were dying, where, there were, where the country was at war against something, it would be very, very, uh, I think, challenging. And I think it would really exploit a lot of the weaknesses in our health system. Mm-hmm. Out of curiosity, why are our hospitals at capacity now? Were they not in the past? No, they always have been. I think that it's it's something that we have lots of emergency department overcrowding. If you go into an emergency department, it takes some time to be seen. Hospitals are sometimes busting at the seams. They can't even handle, for example, in the 2017-18 uh, last year's flu season, they were already basically over capacity, having to, to really... Um, struggle to meet the needs of just a severe flu season, seeing people in the parking lot uh, because they couldn't keep them in the emergency department. Lots of that had, ha- had happened just with a bad flu season. So I do think that when you had something that was even a scale bigger, you would really have a, a major time coping with that in, in our hospital systems. Do you have any thoughts on on what type of healthcare system you think is would be most beneficial for preventing or treating something like this? I don't think it's a system per se, but I do think it has to be a valuing of emergency preparedness in hospitals. So hospitals don't necessarily think about flu or pandemics or mm-hmm. or bioterrorist attacks the way they think about orthopedic surgery. So I do think it has to be a valuing of the emergency preparedness divisions of hospitals so that they are properly resourced, that there are surge plans and capacity, that they think about these types of activities. And, and we have seen some... Uh, improvement, I would say, since, 2000, to, since 2001, because there are programs where hospitals can get funding to develop these types of plans and, and get more, more ready for this. We saw it with Ebola. Now we've got all of these high, high containment units at, at several hospitals around the country. All of that's getting better. And I think it really has to do with recognizing the special importance of infectious diseases and, and the, the impact that they can have, which I mentioned early in the very beginning uh, when we were talking. And but it is something that's hard because it's not the same thing. It's not a revenue generator for a hospital to build a, mm-hmm. a biocontainment unit because they may never use it. Yeah. So it's it's just the whole prevention type of thing. Just the reason why some people forego dental insurance because they don't want to pay for it. But it is something that you have to start to think that this is part of business continuity for for hospitals. That hospitals should be thought of as as assets if there were a biological attack. So I think it's it's something that has to be worked out. And we've gotten better at it. But again, I said it's 18 years after anthrax and things have kind of faded. From from people's memory mm-hmm. and the commitments and, and, and the commitments and the um, the pledges to do this type of thing have kind of faded. And I imagine that's difficult because let's say God forbid there is an attack, like we don't know where it's going to be, right? And, and who knows if those hospitals or you know which hospitals would you equip or? Yeah, so yeah, there are yeah. So difficult. people think about the to- top tier cities in the United States mm-hmm. that you think about where where that would be targets, but you never know. So for example, nobody thought that the first Ebola case diagnosed in the United States would be in Dallas, Texas, but it was. Or that the first right. the first signs of a new flu pandemic in 2009 would be in San Diego, but that's where it was. So th- you you can infectious diseases know no 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 boundaries. And when you're talking about a biological attack, it could appear it could appear anywhere. There are places that are probably higher risk than others, but I think that all hospitals have to have some emergency preparedness planning in place, not just for bioterrorism, but also for infectious disease emergencies, which will kind of all synergize together and make them much more resilient to both. Hey everyone, thanks so much for watching the episode. If you're interested in contributing to the conversation and supporting the show, there's two easy things you can do. One, click subscribe. And two, visit our Patreon page where you get exclusive access to the Exploring Minds community.